We're running the rip under rolling the rolling chair. So. Okay. Oh. Welcome to the February 2021 Planning and Environment Committee meeting. Um, we wish to acknowledge that this meeting is occurring on Gubby Gubby or Kabi Kabi uh, traditional lands, and we respect the contributions that that uh, community has made and their elders, past, present, and emerging. Uh, we have a busy agenda today, um, starting off with item one. I oh, know, starting off with the confirmation of minutes. See, I got it right in the third time. Um, we have anyone wish to move? That was moved by Councillor Stewart. Do we have a seconder? Do we wish to discuss the motion? Yeah, seconder, sorry. seconder was Councillor Pinzel. And just council, remember these are the minutes of the 8th of December because we didn't have a planning and environment committee meeting in January because we just ran the general committee at that time. So, no discussion. All those in favour? We do not have any presentations. We do not have any deputations. So, therefore, we move on to item one. And I believe Councillor Wigner wishes to declare an interest. Yep. Um, I would like to inform the meeting that I have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter as I have a long-standing commercial relationship with New Salon Boards, a surf shop located in Hastings Street, precinct whereby I receive income from royalties from the sale of my surfboards. The tenant in the application before the council is a commercial competitor of New Salon Boards and operates in the same precinct as this proposed development. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will now leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted on. Okay, so discussion on item one. Are there any questions or queries in relation to that report? about the car parking contributions um, involved, please, Karen. Sure. So um, the applicant has proposed, instead of providing um, the full on-site car parking, um, to pay contributions in lieu of that on-site car parking to council. So council has a, a policy, a council policy, around when they would take contributions in lieu of on-site car parking. Uh, this one meets those requirements. Um, so some of the uh, criteria that we look for is whether this site um, is constrained in any way to provide on-site car parking, um, whether there's um, in the community's interest to provide contributions in lieu of on-site parking which could go to public transport or improving our pathways instead of the on-site car parking. Um, so this one uh, certainly meets those requirements. The site is, has access near the roundabout and Mr. Drive, yep. um, so a little bit constrained. It's quite a small site as well um, to fit parking uh, and really to provide and meet the car parking we'd have to do a basement car park, mm -hmm. which would also result in the removal of um, the site's trees, most likely, mm -hmm. um, which we think adds to the streetscape and it's important mm -hmm. they be retained. Um, so we're recommending that Council accept the contributions in lieu instead of the car parking this instance and that would go towards uh, future uh, public transport infrastructure or pathways and the like and I think that's really appropriate for Hastings Street because um, uh, you know um, the, the road system at times does get overwhelmed with traffic in our peak holiday seasons and we're better at looking, better off looking at alternative means for people to come to the site. And 198,000 thereabouts for those contributions. Yeah, yeah. So that is set by the policy, um, yeah. which is subject to CPI. Yeah. Um, yeah. And one-off payment, obviously. It's yeah. a one-off payment, yeah. and it stays with the land as well. So in the future, uh, okay. in 50 years' time, if they look to redevelop, that would be taken into consideration again. Okay. Thank you. Council Sonic, one of the councils I can't recall it was asked this to go to General Committee. Um, is there any other questions or information you want? Council Pinzel. Oh, that was Council Pinzel, wasn't it? Mm. Yeah. Is there any other questions or information you wanted before it's considered by the General Committee on Monday? Is there any additional information? Um, I have a question. Um, at what stage does Council impose conditions regarding use of um, short term accommodation? Um, is it once this is approved, is it when the use commences? 
Um, and is this an opportunity for us to look at um, conditioning their short-term accommodation provisions? Hmm. So we did consider that in looking at this application um, and whether we should be imposing similar conditions that we've been imposing on some other other short-term accommodation. Um, in this instance, we thought it wasn't, a, wasn't relevant or appropriate because uh, this area is really intended for short-term visitor accommodation and it really doesn't have the permanent residence like we see in some of our other areas that we're getting short-term accommodation applications. So there's not uh, the amenity impacts and the same concerns there. So um, going forward, it, we didn't think it was appropriate to sort of try and control the number of people being accommodated in that unit or use of outdoor areas because and we think it can be managed successfully just through the design as well as the future local law. Um, where are you concerned, Kerry? There's a third storey, and that's my understanding, an open space where the barbecue and open area is. Mm. So um, no concerns that noise will emanate from the rooftop? No. Um, I mean, that is, there is a potential for that, and there's a potential um, for that to occur all the way through Hastings Street. But I have to say that's not something we've ever experienced in terms of complaints um, between visitor accommodation providers in Hastings Street um, because you know the street is largely commercial uses operate generally till midnight yep. at least um, you've got other balconies and visitor accommodation lots of people in the area already you don't have the permanent residence there's no permanent residence in Hastings Street anymore they, you know, they are all used for visitor accommodation Kerry, just a question moving on from that. If there's no conditions around the STA with the number of people there, how will you manage like the car park situation hmm. if we're going to accept people in the loop? Yeah. Um, well, the car parking numbers are set by the scheme. Um, so they're, they're based on the, the size of the number, you know, the number of bedrooms proposed in the short term accommodation. So they are. Um, based on the combination of on-site car parking and the contributions in lieu should address the car parking. Um, yes, there is the potential for people to accommodate and try and pack them in there. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so th there is that potential. But I think um, w we have to acknowledge that in Hastings Street, a lot of people do come without a car, that they do come by public transport or they you know, catch the airport shuttle. Um, so I think that's, that's reasonable. Um, but if, if council was concerned, uh, we could place a similar condition on this one as we have others. But next Monday, I'm just going through the report, we've got a number of architectural type drawings, but we don't seem to have a good one which shows the streetscape view. Would that be something that they would have submitted? So we yeah. could have a look at on Monday? Yeah, we do have a, a rendering. The rendering only shows the lower level, but it does show the straight view, given that the top level is significantly set back from yep. the street front. Yeah. Is good. that in the report? Yeah. Okay. Um, there is a, yeah, a screenshot on there. But I can give you a, a larger photo. Oh, so that, that one which just shows golden that's yeah, street, that, that's all you got? Yeah, that's so the one on page 13 is all we have. Oh, okay. Oh, I don't need it. Very <laughs> good. <laughs> okay, if there's no more questions, I'm uh, going to have a motion to refer this matter to the General Committee, General Committee for the purposes of being significant. Of the significance. Yes, yes. Second by Councillor Stewart. You don't wish to discuss that any further? No, that's fine. Thank All in favour? That was unanimous. Okay. Councillor Wickham, mate. used for short-term accommodation at 3 Robert Street, Nooseville. Now, this item's also been requested to be referred, but do we have any questions or uh, requests for further clarification to be brought to Monday's meeting? Good question, Kerry. Just, we, we obviously, the last time we came to this meeting, we had a very similar application for short-term letting in, in Hill Street. Uh, so, just in regard to page 36, is this the um, number six, all outdoor areas including balconies, decks, pools and the like must not be used after 9pm. That was 
what we had at the last one. Is that is that just maintaining the status quo, or is that what the um, the applicants have asked for or agreed to? Or um, the application material didn't include uh, comments about what time that they would use the outside areas. Um, the condition was put on consistent with the original recommendation from the last meeting we had, the, okay. the property in Hill Street. <laughs> I did have conversations with the applicant around that and they did not object to the 9pm time frame in this okay. instance. Yeah. Thanks, Patrick. Yeah. Well, we've got quite a, quite a few questions. Are you done? Uh, I've got one more. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just in regard to the code of conduct, um, it's in, uh, on page 37. Um, a code 115. A code of conduct must be developed and provided to all users and occupants of short term accommodation, including any website or social media uh, used to promote the use of the premises for short term accommodation. Um, in that regard, are you talking about the code of conduct that council is currently in the development of, or will they have to? Will they the people they're going through to short term let this provide that? Or um, this is a code of conduct which needs to be provided by the uh, the operator yeah. of, of this facility. Um, this condition was generated um, based on some of the conversation that was coming out of the local law um, and, and, and is reflective of those requirements. Um, obviously that local law hasn't been implemented, so until such time we're seeing the need to, to have yeah. And, and have, have you had discussions with the um, operators in regard to that code of conduct or are they happy to do that or is that the, you know, that's... Uh, they've said that they're willing to have a requirement for, you know, a code of conduct. They haven't gone into the same kind of detail as what we've, we've stipulated. Mm -hmm. I think it's pretty standard for a holiday house. Yeah. You know, when people are renting it out to have like some sort of code, yeah. some basic rules written yeah, down. Rules. Do yeah, we sign off rules. on that? Or? Um, the conditions don't call for us to sign off on it. Um, okay. It's really for the, the applicant to provide. And I think it'll vary a little bit between the house and, you know, as the owner, what they'd like to see in the code yeah. of conduct as okay. well. Mm. All right. Thanks. Thanks. I know New South Wales have actually legislated for compulsory codes of conduct for short term mm. Under the Fair Trading Act, or something like that. So, when it comes to that, you know, these, um, what happens if they don't comply with these conditions? Are, are there penalties? What What is the penalty structure and schedule? Mm. Yeah. So, um, being a planning approval, it's governed by the planning legislation, um, and there's some options for council. Um, uh, our Our approach with planning matters is to give some. Um, some advice, try an educational in the first instance, um, but then we can move towards uh, fines if we collect sufficient evidence to show that they are in breach of those conditions. Um, and those fines can vary depending if the site's owned by a company or an individual. Um, alternatively, we're able to issue formal notices under the Planning Act, um, us asking them and basically demanding that they comply with the approval conditions. And ultimately, if they're still non compliance, council can make an application to the Planning Environment Court and seek compliance with those conditions. Is, it, is there a way to, do, to refuse them to take back their Airbnb or a short term stay at, uh, license? Is it a license that we're giving them? Or a, it's a okay. development approval. Development approval. Uh, no, there's no way to cancel a development approval for non compliance with a development approval condition. The Planning Act doesn't provide for that. So that one of the issues is once you we we'll, we give this approve this we can never take it back. Then. That's it, right. And Through so the, it's a permanent change. It is a permanent change. Um, so that's something that the the local law can do with non compliance with the local law um, that can be written into a local law to cancel their approval under the local law, but not a development approval. Have we? Um, this is all relatively new. So have have we gone down this track of of issuing? fines yet and, and compliance um, orders? Uh, not for short-term accommodation. The first one applications we've had have only been reported to council recently, so it's still a little bit too early there. Um, I want to go down, do, do you have anything else to talk about, you know, the, the compliance issue? Because then I want to talk about um, the issues that, that we mentioned, which is the clarity of the rules that council is following for the approval process, which is the um, retention of the primary residential function of the area. And 
See, I, I went down there yesterday, and when I read what uh, what the 2020 plan says, that, for example, a development ensures permanent residents of Newseville enjoy a high level of residential amenity and accessibility to urban services and so forth. And over here under PO6D, the retention of the primary residential function of the area. So we often talk about it's a it's primarily a residential function. And so that is the overarching policy rule that we're looking at. Mm -hmm. And I walked the streets around there yesterday, and I, in my opinion, there's just no way in the world that that the primary residential function of that area is still residential. It's just, it's a holiday rental zone. And if you look on the the map on page forty six, you know that unfortunately you don't have the benefit of um, I've colored in the areas. And so this, I colored it in green. So this entire street is, is holiday rentals. And this is completely holiday rentals. And even one over, this Janet Street is holiday rentals. And when you drive around there, you, you feel, I, I, I debate whether anyone would actually feel as though that this is primarily a residential area. It is. It has morphed into a holiday rental area already. So it, it, it seems to me that there is confusion in the wording of the town plan as to whether this is actually applicable to be, to um, to allow short term stays here in this area. Does anybody have any discussion on that or thoughts on that? Well, we are going to debate on Monday. It may be worth asking staff the, the rationale um, behind why those traditional areas like that that had a mix of uh, residential and tourism were retained in medium density residential versus tourist accommodation zone. And there were, it was well debated, and Nooseville, Old Nooseville is a key area where that occurs. And you're right, um, if you remember the first draft of the, of the draft plan plan had that area identified within a a tourism overlay, a short stay overlay. Um, that overlay was retracted, and one of the reasons that was included was to recognise that historically there was this mix in these locations that wasn't favoured by the community, so we pulled away. But it's something we could bring forward on Monday, just a bit of an explanation. Well, um, yeah. um, Brett, with on, on Monday, can I possibly bring a motion saying that the wording of the town plan is so broad? that two people can look at can read the town plan look at the how look at the the uh, application for short term stay and come up with the exact opposite conclusion and both equally argue there is very very little um, depth and and saying that you know beyond saying that it's primary res residential function which is the key element of this of the town plan for uh, medium density dwellings and that is just not guidance for the the applicant for, for Kerry Coyle in that department it's not guidance for myself I don't know it and then when we talk about when we say this you give you you know you you, you approve the application you're giving this property as a short-term rental forever and you are forever changing the dynamic of that residential, primary residential area. And I think it's past the tipping point already. Long question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, short, yes. answer, short answer, short <laughs> answer everyone, everyone gets opinions about the planning scheme issues. Um, the bottom line is that the council sets its policy through a planning scheme framework. What you're trying to achieve, you set through your planning scheme. And in relation to the short term, what our current planning scheme, which the council adopted in July last year, it's based on a zoning approach. So if you are in the short, uh, sorry, if you want to have short-term accommodation, our planning scheme currently focuses those on a number of zones and says these are zones where it may be appropriate to have a short stay, and that is um, the tourist accommodation zone, the high density and the medium density. That is different to where you have a low density residential where the planning scheme says we don't want, or effectively says we don't want short-term accommodation in there. So the way that the planning scheme assess 
at the start of the assessment process is what zone is this in? And if it's in this case is medium density, medium density residential, is the planning scheme is saying that that is an area where it may be appropriate to have short term accommodation. And if the council doesn't like the result that's giving, then you change the scheme, but you don't change one application. You deal with the, the scheme provides certainty for people about where or where they can't make applications for, um, in this case, short term accommodation. So that's the purpose of the planning scheme is to give indications to both staff and to applicants what the council's policy setting in is, and if you're not getting results that like, you're getting results that you don't like, then you change the policy setting. It, it, so can I clarify? The question in regard would it be possible to bring a motion? The motion would not be relevant to this item because right. irrelevant. The motion would be to start a review of the new plan. Well, in fact, that that issue is already there. One of the conditions there were eight conditions of the minister in terms of our um, planning scheme approval. One of those conditions was that council monitor for two years what's happening with the short term accommodation to see how that policy is applying. And at the end of that two years, prepare a report and provide that report to the government or the minister within six months about what is happening with the short-term accommodation based on our current policy setting. Okay. So Can I have a subsequent question because it follows on? To Kerry, is there other, any other guidance rather than other than the clause that uh, Council Wigner referred to? Is there any other guidance within the document that lets your staff and yourself? Um, have criteria by which you assess when it may or may not be suitable in the medium density residential zone? Mm. Well, the, the residential medium density zone, the tables of assessment identify that it is a consistent use. So immediately there's, um, you know, that's where we're saying we want to see them. Um, but I have to agree with Councillor Wagner in some respect that the primary predominantly, people can come up with different um, conclusions around that. And I think more guidance in the scheme would be useful. Because um, there is a lot of visitor accommodation in the area. Have we reached the tipping point? I guess officers are saying no, based on our research of short-term accommodation in the area. Um, but if the expectation that there's a higher balance of more permanents, which I guess that's what the submitters are suggesting yeah. to us, then we should review that element. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did, would, would you recommend a, a sense of caution when giving these, or uh, uh, saying okay to these applications, when it's a permanent thing, and in two years' time, when we review this, we go, oh, geez, we mucked that up. Well, let's, okay, okay, erase that, let's uh, go go back. Well, you can't go back. It, it, it's a set, it's a done deal. So the review in two years is, um, I know that that's, that that's the plan going forward. It seems, is, it, is that too far away, do you think? Can, can we pull it forward, Brett? Well, it's up to council, but certainly the ministerial condition has said that we have to do that assessment during two years. And often you don't see trends in the short term. You'll only see them over, over time. Um, just come back to your point about, you know, an application does give an approval. That approval does attach to the land and is binding on successors and title. That's the same with every approval that council gives. That, that is what we do. Um, it's a land use, plan, a land use approval. So um, it, it does create um, that use right. And that use right does attach to the land, as I said, is binding on future owners and <coughs> yeah. gives those rights and obligations. Yeah. So, so that, just if I can, subsequently on that, so the suggestion in the question regarding holding off until the review, um, from a council perspective, um, what would you say the risk in terms of losing legal appeals if we refuse to consistent use in an area which has already a large number of holiday and short stay accommodation type facilities. I don't give legal advice to council other than to say that obviously you're always on the back foot if you're trying to defend a, a, a decision um, where we've made a decision that's inconsistent with our planning scheme. One of the reasons we've always been successful in the court um, and we've won virtually every case for the last number of years um, is we're consistent with what our planning scheme says and that's where you, you get success. When you go against your own planning scheme, that's when you run into trouble in the courts. Mm -hmm. <coughs> go ahead. Yeah, that was my segue into that, and I did have a few questions for staff, but I, I was going to send them as an email. But quickly, in an overview, my concern when reading through these applications, I myself was triggered to ask the question about at what point is that going to reach saturation point where we lose the amenity of. Um, residential and neighbourhood, it appears that if we continue to 
approve the applications based on the requirements, which to date they have ticked all those boxes. Um, is there a process by which, um, you know, a mechanism is triggered that we've reached the saturation point and it will turn into ultimately a precinct that is for short-term accommodation only? And is that what we want? And how is how can the staff communicate to the councillors making this decision or tracking the number of approvals so at a point when I've got to make a decision I can also be aware of the percentage and where we're heading given that it is a permanent decision to retain as an STA mm. when at some point if the horse is bolted and this becomes a precinct I wasn't here in the lead up and all the discussions around that so is the rationale to create a precinct or do we want to maintain a balance of both, both especially given the um, long-term accommodation for permanent residents, given that there's such a shortage now, do we re need to rethink that? And two years is a long time for that review. I understand it is what state has recommended, but for my purpose, I would like to be able to know in the reports what percentage we're at or how many, how do we track it? Because I also note that uh, we've got six short-term accommodations have been decided by delegated authority. So that doesn't even come to us, it's the decision is made. Um, I'd like to have some mechanism in place where we have that information, just so in my mind, I've got a, you know, more information regarding this, you know, these decisions because this is a long-term future impact and is this the direction we want to take? Hmm. So there's a few questions in that. So mm. Yeah, there is a few. Yeah. Oh, I <laughs> if, I, if I miss something, please let me know. I'm happy to email those through and yeah. or you can bring them back. Why, why don't we do some of them now? I think it's useful just in the conversation, yeah. the context of the conversation, to do some now and if there's others yeah. that are missing, Karen, follow up after yeah, the meeting. Sure. That'd be great. Yeah. Thank um, you. So a few things. Uh, officers are trying to present to council the information that you're looking for. You know, we are okay. presenting to you what short-term accommodation in the area exists from our research, mm. um, and obviously any approvals um, that are given or superseded scheme requests that will be also be shown in yeah, the report. And I agree, because I've looked at the maps and then yeah. I go, oh my gosh, this is saturation. And it is very so. relevant for us to consider because the scheme has the words predominantly or primarily. Um, right. residential and yeah. um, those words um, I'd like some more clarity around those because they can be interpreted differently mm. um, right. and yeah. obviously submitters are suggesting it's already at saturation point mm. um, as a planning officer we're saying well it still is predominantly permanent residential in mm. the area um, so we don't we think it meets the scheme requirements okay. um, in terms of the two year, if this is something you know council is feeling strongly, we're obviously getting a lot of feedback through these applications that people have some concerns around it. Mm -hmm. There's no reason council couldn't bring that forward okay. if they wished. Um, but obviously, um, we need to prioritise what we do with our with mm -hmm. our strategic planning team. But if it's if it's so critical that that could be brought forward, if council wished to review that earlier. Well, one of the other things interesting about that two year period is that. The council adopted the scheme in July last year, and probably for the first, well, I'm guessing, three or four months, the market was a bit strange in that COVID environment about yeah. you know what was happening with people putting properties in or out of short-term accommodation. So, I think we've probably only got yeah. close to normality, if I can call it normality, in terms of accommodation yeah. around November, December. Yeah. So, probably a bit of a loss of that, that time yeah. there. There is certainly, you know, this was one of the biggest issues in developing the new scheme and the there was biggest the biggest issue <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, there was a lot of submissions both for and against mm. proposed provisions and obviously we went through a process of actually advertising our scheme a second time mm. um, and going out there again and asking the community around this issue. Um, so it's certainly a vexed issue, you know, the, the investors who want to um, buy properties in the area and, and market it out to short-term accommodation were very strong in saying that this should be allowed. Mm. Um, but then there were other residents who were very vocal in saying, look, this impacts on our amenity, it impacts on the, the neighbourhood, mm. was also very strong. So it was a difficult issue. Mm. And I guess council in adopting the scheme came to, um, tried to come to a balanced approach. Using the zonings. Using the zonings. Yeah. Kerry, my concern is, and is this, is this a concern that you would take into account, that 
if we don't allow short-term letting in these in this medium density that is consistent currently with the scheme, then an owner of this property, and we've got to think commercially because we can, whatever we decide here, this ultimately it was the owner's decision. The owner can lock this house up and say, well, I'm going to travel six months a year and not use it. If I can't short-term rent it, I'm not going to sell it because prices are going up. I'm just going to, and then we're going to create a lot of locked up, then we're, then we're not creating neighbourhoods because we've got a lot of houses that are just closed up and locked up because the people have got a lot of money and if they can't short term it, they'll just hold on and use it one month a year. Is that a, is that a concern or a consideration in regard to these sort of applications? It was certainly one of the issues that was uh, form submissions from those people who are very supportive of having short-term accommodation, the fact that that can happen. Mm. And you do have owners that might choose to do that. Um, owners still may choose to do that regardless of allowing mm. short-term accommodation. So it's it's not the only issue for us to consider. There's, I think there's a broad range of issues in looking at short-term accommodation mm. from you know the impact on our residential neighbourhoods the impact on our other tourism providers. I don't think we're seeing many resorts necessarily built in, in Noosa because we've got so many short-term accommodation providers. So there's there's multitude of issues in trying to weigh up what the right approach is mm. uh, for council. Do you also want to mention just, I'll call it as a right use for people if they're living there, they can go away and how many times they can use per year. We've sort of covered some of that. If people do lock up and want to travel, they can still use their place for short-term as a right. Yeah, so just, just as Brett's, one of the, I guess, the considerations that um, was uh, in, in the current scheme is the allowance for landowners to rent their um, accommodation out without an application to council up to four times a year, 60 mm -hmm. nights. So those people who only live in part-time, there was sort of that provision made for to give them the opportunity mm -hmm. that when they went away, they could rent it out and it didn't remain locked up. So that... Uh, I guess that responded to the issue that you, you raised. Brett, would there be legal implications if we, if people bought in this area based on the fact that it's medium density and it's consistent to short term let under the scheme, under the plan, and they bought on that proviso that they can rent it out? And now, if we potentially take that away, is that, is, would there be legal implications in regard to that? No, we go through, I guess the question is, you know, what's the implication for changing planning schemes? Mm. And there are some um, that use it or lose it, so you've got 12 months to either make an application of the superseder scheme or you might, you know, if you got knocked back, you might have uh, compensation rights. Um, that risk is always there, um, but that's the same every time we bring in a new town planning scheme. Yeah. That's yeah. the case um, when, you, when you deal with that. Uh, and that's why we went through, I think, last year about a lot of the implications yeah. in terms of that um, yeah. injurious affection, or what's now called compensation claims. But the process you have to go through to be able to get to that point is you've got to be making an application, you've got to decide to use it, you've got to get knocked back and so on. So um, it's not that common, yeah, um, okay. but you not couldn't rule it out either. Yeah. Of course, there's the other side of the coin. Is what Are there legal ramifications or legal, legal rights for, uh, for those 18 people that responded saying they do not want this? That What do you call that? The objection, the 18 objections. Mm. I mean, could they be saying, I moved here because this was a residential neighborhood, and now through backdooring the planning scheme, it's no longer a residential neighborhood. I want compensation. So they won't be able to get compensation, but a submitter can uh, lodge an appeal against if the council, for example, approved this application. A submitter could go, no, we don't agree with that, and lodge an application to the court to challenge the council's decision. Um, that obviously would um, then be subject to that application being determined by the court and what the court would look at, does that application meet the planning scheme or not? If it does, the court's likely to approve it. If it doesn't, then it's likely to not attack. So what happens in those appeals is the court effectively stands in the shoes of the council and makes that assessment as the planning authority. So these are all good questions. Well, we'll I, I, a couple I, more, a couple more. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to respond <laughs> to one. Um, this, this site is very close to a street named Gympie Terrace. Gimpy Terrace is named that because it's a traditional holiday home for the rich people of Gimpy in the very early times of Noosa. Mm. To say it's predominantly residential, it's actually been more tourist than residential. So your original question about whether the zone, the, the intent of the zone within our planning scheme re reflects the intent of the use is the question to ask and, and perhaps something um, 
that staff may want to do on Monday is have a look at maybe bringing some of the the zone maps to clarify where is zone medium density and of the areas zone medium density which ones have said we don't want short-term accommodation which is equally as important but I do believe that the review like there's, there's even one whole zone we elected not to use that could perhaps provide a middle ground uh, zone in the act called low medium that we may say well in the review we might want to put those areas in low medium with similar provisions but without short stay if it hasn't already got a lot of short stay so there's lots of options so another question okay probably the last question but what what weight does staff give to the 18 complaints or objections hmm. so it's not the number of submissions received it is uh, the issues they raise and um, the relevance of those in terms of the planning scheme requirements so it's about the issues they raise why they're objecting um, that we take into consideration in looking at the, um, the proposal. So the fact that we get 18, 50 or 1 is, is, um, is not really so relevant. It's about the issues they raise. And those, and those are obviously, I don't have to question, but that they're adequately uh, reflected in here, even though it's relatively how many paragraphs. What page, Tom? Oh, that page um, 46. Yeah. Yeah, so we yeah. do a summary of the submissions we receive and the issues people raise in those letters. Mm -hmm. um, the submissions are all online for people to view, um, so councillors can read them all, um, the community can read other submissions that people write in and raise. Kerry, are you finished, Tom? Yeah, Kerry, yeah. thank you. I, I'm just following on from the, the question of the people who complained or um, lodged a complaint. Now, they've got in there, I'm just, some of the complaints were that it's, per, it's predominantly permanent residential. That's what that what's, what's that's what they said in in their complaint. Um, but there is a number, isn't there? And they're complaining about potentially you know increases in car parking, rubbish, loss of community noise. But in Robert Street, correct me if I'm wrong, and I don't have a map up. Isn't there a number of sort of holiday large holiday accommodation providers in that street or just off that street, and which is what Tom was alluding to before about. Yes. So, yeah. on what basis are they, with this one particular house, are they justifying that if they live in that street? Do we know, my, my question I guess is, do we know where they're coming from because are they in other residential houses because there seems to be already so much holiday accommodation there? This, this um, image here details where the submissions have been received from. Oh, okay, great. So it's quite broad ranging it's broad, and, yeah. and some quite far away from the site. Yes. Mm. One next door, one two up. Yeah. Kerry, can I ask a question? So this, um, the house is located in a medium density residential zone. Um, if the house wasn't built on the site, what would be allowed to be built on that site? And um, would that result in a higher density of occupancy and would it result in more car parking and noise impacts that, that's, than that which has been recognised with this one residential house? So I'll let you ask the question. Okay. Thank you. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the, the medium density residential zone allows a duplex to be built on there and it's a 718 square metre site. So I would expect they could build um, two, three bedroom at least uh, units on that site. Um, so each would uh, likely have you know, a double car garage with a bit of parking. So you are looking at quite a number of people that would be permitted on the site. Um, I think the issues that submitters are raising in part perhaps comes from, you know, under the previous scheme, short term accommodation was not regulated in any way. And it was causing some real impacts for people who live next door. You know, the issues they cite around car parking, waste, noise are all very valid issues. Um, so I think that uh, by imposing the conditions we're recommending, we'll help manage that and the local law will go the next step as well to managing that. Can I have a follow-on question? Because I had some technical planning questions in my mind that's come up. So a dwelling house defined under the Act as is a dwelling house, is it? Yeah, detached house, I think. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, they keep changing the definitions. If you have a short-term accommodation over a conventional dwelling house, 
is that an additional use? And does the, like where I'm getting to is a dwelling house, you're, re, you're constrained to a single household. Will that constraint on a single household apply if there's a short term accommodation oh, approval on it? Because the problem we have is that the modern holiday, the, the, the traditional holiday house never had problems. The modern holiday house is seen as where you have three families coming in and have all the problems that the submitters are concerned about. So my question is, how can we technically uh, condition or limit the approval for a holiday house to a holiday house for a single household because it's in a dwelling? Okay, here's a scenario for you. <laughs> this is a separate use on the planning scheme okay. to a detached house. Okay. So potentially, if they operated this short-term accommodation council approves it, and they operated it for some years, it might be said that they've actually abandoned the original approval or use rights for a house on the site. So they may not be able to revert to that in the future, unless they came back. That's an interesting argument. That's, yeah. <laughs> that's, 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 that's what I was thinking, is that we actually it's now it is general. defined as a separate use. Yeah, it is defined as a separate so, use. Therefore, it's not just part of a house. Um, okay, so then for Monday, can you bring back um, some thinking about whether the conditions adequately would control the use of the house and whether it would be um, within the scope of the intent of short-term accommodation to have conditions which require it to be a single household? I'll let you think about it till Monday. Um. Okay, I can have a think about it, but my, my thoughts are our planning scheme requirements for short-term accommodation um, go, don't go there in terms of household. They only go to the number of bedrooms. And so that's why council um, officers are recommending a maximum number of persons based mm. on the number of bedrooms they're proposed. Mm. So it doesn't talk about oh. or try and restrict that two families might rent the house. Yeah, um, I suppose you've got the restraint on the cars as well. Yeah, we've got a restriction on the number of people, ultimately. Um, <laughs> that's what, how we're trying to manage that situation. Um, just following on with Brian's line of thought, Kerry. So, if you're saying that if the land use is for short-term accommodation only, and they forfeit or waiver their rights to use the house predominantly as their principal place of residence, then is the short-term accommodation land use then a commercial use and therefore outside the scope of a medium density residential zoning? Um, I, I'm just wondering, you know, is, is that something that you can maybe think about and in line with where Ryan's going with the use of a principal house of, of um, resident being used solely for short-term accommodation mm. purposes. So the planning regulations and our planning scheme have followed that, but it is a separate use defined under the planning scheme. It's separate defined, it's no longer a house, they're two distinct uses. If people wish to maintain both those use rights, then their application really should be for short-term oh, accommodation choice. and detached house, and then the approval enshrines both. Um, Few I mean, I, I have my own <laughs> opinion around short-term combination. Mm -hmm. I think it is a commercial use. Mm -hmm. um, it's not necessarily residential. And I guess that's what we're wrestling with as to whether um, our planning scheme uh, is doing the job it should do in terms of protecting that, that residential amenity in the yeah. area. So is there an opportunity in an MCU application to condition the application um, that identifies it as being a commercial use and throw some conditions in the application with that, Kerry? Just well, that, that's what we're doing by the conditions. So I'm not sure what other conditions we would look to include. So our planning approval can't, can't control how much it's rented out for or anything around that. Um, around that. It has to be around the use of it and the operation of it. So I'm not, not quite sure. Yeah, I, I'm wondering whether it's consistent with the um, restrictions and the guidelines given to, say, Kymo or Sunset or the um, accommodation providers nearby that there's got to be probably more level playing field if the purpose is solely to, for commercial purposes. Um, maybe we should be hmm. thinking more along the lines to make it um, fairer for, for the other operators. 
Yeah, I'm not sure what that would look like, but certainly, you know, the local law will go a little step further, which it can do than a planning approval and, you know, call up, you know, you can't register unless you've got a pool that's fully compliant, you've got a building that's, you know, fully compliant with requirements, you know, there's the proper fire measures in place and all those things. So it'll go a step further, which will apply, I think, to commercial operators and perhaps what you're looking for. But a planning approval um, won't, it's, it's not appropriate for those sorts of conditions. Okay. I'll well, check whether Karen had any more questions. Yeah, no. yeah, no, like, yeah. Um, yeah. My intent today of raising this today with regards to the saturation point is is a good argument and I've enjoyed the conversation. Mm. Um, but my intent is more about if we're looking at um, affordable housing and some, um, you know, long term rental for our essential workers that have been pushed out of the area, my concern is if we create whole precincts that don't create opportunity for our essential workers to have affordable rent and we lose that, how are we going to claim that back? And it seems a contradiction when the Mayor's put a minute forward to seek land, but also to me that could also be inclusive of, you know, infrastructure that's currently built, for example. Are we making best use of that built structure that has been approved? And I understand that we're looking at, you know, short-term accommodation um, and approving that, but my concern is that if we dilute it too far, that we, and we can't get it back, how are we going to create affordable housing for essential workers given it is challenging to find any land um, in the Shire? Yeah. That's a terrific question. It is. <laughs> and, and it's one that, I'll, I'll go first and you jump in, Kerry. And, and it's one that the council in the previous term debated at length. Mm -hmm. And really the issues that came up, and it was a really thorny debate during the, the development of the planning scheme leading up to the adoption in July, there were two issues that kept coming up in relation to short-term accommodation. One was, I call it, amenity issues, you know, noise and mm. parking, all that sort of stuff. And the second was about the capacity to retain residential suburbs for their mm. ultimate purpose, which was for people living permanently or to rent permanently. Um, and that's where the council ended up saying, well, how do, you, how do you get both the best of both of those worlds? How do you still have a tourism sector that's going to develop and grow? And how do you then protect residential amenity and residential capacity to have people who can live and, and work and, and rent mm -hmm. in that area. So that's why they end up going down the zoning approach to say that traditional low density residential areas is where people traditionally, mums, dads and the kids live mm -hmm. and um, you know, kids playing cricket in the street, all that sort of stuff. So that's where we try and protect that as much as we can. We don't want um, short term accommodation going into those traditional residential areas. But if you're going to have it, then have it in the medium density, high density and tourism mm -hmm. zones. So that's, that's the policy setting the council to try and yeah. achieve that. Kerry, do you want to add to that? Oh, you said everything I was going to say, <laughs> but probably better. <laughs> yeah. and, and it's a policy question for council. Yeah. It's one that the, the previous right. council grappled with for th probably three years out of the four years, and, and it's one you guys had to deal with when you got mm. the planning scheme straight up um, after mm. the election. Yeah. Um, and it's one that hasn't gone away. Oh. It's, a, it's, a, it's a really interesting argument about to what extent does the council mm. have the right to um, try and regulate people's choice about whether or not they can live in it, rent it permanently or rent it <coughs> short term, mm -hmm. and how do you offset it out about the, the economic value of some short term accommodation for um, the tourism sector compared to the rights of residential um, neighbours to be able to enjoy quiet amenity mm -hmm. and to have um, traditional suburbs not, not uh, change the nature of them. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's a, yeah. <laughs> that's why you paid the big bucks as council. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being a bit facetious, but that's the balance you have to do. You know, like, yeah, it's not, not easy. In the end, the, the, I suppose the compromise in medium density residential, and I suppose more so the high density residential, is we said in the scheme says that all the new area that we zoned in medium density around the junction and the high density around the junction and all that new area in the high density residential around the civic cannot be used for short term accommodation. So we said. We realise the work accommodation is a big issue. They best are located close to where the jobs are, mm. so that those areas are excluded. Or they have, well, I forget how it was worded, but anyway. So that was the compromise situation for sort of the, the more high density zones, whereas low density they are made inconsistent. But regardless of the planning scheme we adopted last year, this area has been morphing for probably ten to fifteen years anyway. Mm. Rambo's Gibby mm. Terrace, those high popular areas, they have been going yeah. through a, a change mm. just due to market forces. 
Mm. Carrying on from Amelia's question, so with an, an, an Airbnb, you build a house that you get a normal, you know, a normal house that you would live in, and then it can be changed to a, to a short term stay. And then across the road, you have a holiday rental um, uh, precinct or, or building. Let's see, well, let's see, what they say Como over there. Um, when they build Como, they, there are certain um, requirements that they have because this is going to be like the, the fireproof, the walls, the, the, the double waving windows. There are, uh, I once had a builder, when we're looking at Biddy Street, the builder says, well, this can't be, you know, a rental because it hasn't complied with all because he builds um, rental properties like that. And he said, well, it, it can't be an Airbnb because it doesn't, a rental property because it doesn't qualify with a numerous array of um, requirements. That, you know, a, a house has one set of requirements, a commercial building has another set of requirements. And it seemed, are we, you're saying it's a commercial premises, a business, without the requirements, is that right? Mm. Um, so we have uh, asked a question of our building certifiers as to whether there would be required to be upgrades of the house uh, where they're used for short-term accommodation. And they're saying that the current requirements of the building code would not generate or um, trigger a requirement for further uh, smoking smoke detectors or the like. There would be no other requirements that they can use the house at the moment. Whether we'll see that change in the future, as you know, because it's this is growing, it's been a, a growing thing in recent times, whether we see the, a change in the building code and they'll be required to comply after that. But at the moment there's no requirements. We do though have um, an application now. Is it an application? Uh, yeah. Yes. We do have an application where someone's seeking to convert an existing house into three short-term accommodation units. Um, and whilst we haven't got advice back yet from our building certifier, I suspect that that's where there will be additional firewalls and requirements mm. that would need to be put in place. And I would suspect that will be one of the reasons that this house may be very difficult to convert um, for that purpose. Mm. But that's something we're still getting some advice on. Okay, so just, just the last one, sorry, one last comment. When, for, for the viewers out there, there, there might be a debate and uh, about whether to split this through or um, allow this, you know, to vote for it as the staff as a staff recommendation. But we're both going to be leaning on the on the planning scheme. We're both going to say the twenty twenty planning scheme says this, and then the, then the 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 opposing view will say the twenty twenty scheme says this. So it's it's the interpretation of the town plan that is that question, and that that's why I bring that that's that's the big issue that. Looking at. And you've got professional town planning staff who have given you advice based on their interpretation of the schemes. Mm. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Which you should take seriously. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Do we wish to conclude the questions That's in good. preparation for Monday? So and probably save time for Monday. Refer the matter? Anyone like to? I'll move that motion to be referred to Monday uh, due to the significance of the matter. Yeah, so we've obviously had good discussion. Can I just clarify, was there anything in particular that councillors want us to come back with further information? Because I feel like we have answered questions today, but mm. happy to expand on any particular matters councillors um, would like. I'm interested in the process around um, capturing the percentage, um, you know, either in numbers or percentage of what's been approved, sort of what's in the pipeline, Especially given the um, you know the bulk approvals that come through, and it, um, I don't know. That's just in my mind to keep a track of. Like if we're saying saying yes, 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 and it complies, I'm interested in the saturation of the area um, and how can staff provide that information. I mean, do I just send you an email, for example, when these come up there singly, or is there some way you can mention that in the report? Um, we'll, we'll have a look at that before Monday and yeah. be able to give advice about whether or not that's going to be possible of building that sort of analysis into a report. We're not mm. sure if it is or not, but we'll know that by Monday. Yeah, so we do keep the database. Yep. Yes, we, yeah, we, yeah. we have yeah. A, a detailed database which is recording um, all, all approvals, yeah. uh, including superseded scheme approvals. We have also built a database um, doing research on all the short-term accommodation yeah. out there mm -hmm. in the Shire. So we have quite a database around that. Yeah. So the map is good, it gives me a visual, but some, you know, some 
numbers with that would also be helpful. Yeah. That could just be yeah so i'll just ask sort of clarity like the map is fairly limited in what we've given yeah. you yeah. is that the sort of area that you're looking for or a little bit broader than that probably a little bit broader okay well that had the zoning on it of each each area is that what you're talking about or is that what yeah we will stop do the zoning maps yeah. too yeah yeah i had an yeah. initial one i said maybe come back but i can't remember what it is now i think it was the zoning maps mm -hmm. yes the zoning the maps yeah, yeah. Yeah, because every time one of these comes up, we're going to be, be drilling down on exactly the same issue. So yeah. I think what, uh, mm. what uh, no. Karen, I was going to say Councillor Finville, <laughs> has, has, is requesting is, is going to be, is, we're going to see this over and over again. Mm. Mm. Yeah. And given we're you know, collecting data and making decisions that will go back to state for that review, whether that's two years or shorter, depending on outcomes, I think it's just good practice. Mm. Yeah, we certainly collecting all the data we have all that. And can I ask Kerry to include in that data, just so that we are, you know, we're collectively talking about data-driven decisions, can we also have a um, number of complaints? So I think that's quite relevant too. Um, I know that a lot of people are formalising the, their objections and complaints, and I just think that um, we need again to collate that information and need some hard evidence as to numbers yeah yeah we're definitely um recording those complaints right. previously we we didn't so much because we couldn't do anything about it but since the commencement of the new planning scheme we've been recording it and i know know the data i'm happy to send this out but we've had 49 complaints about short-term accommodation since the planning scheme commenced um, and i think people are complaining making more complaints now because Council has obviously advertised that we're trying to address the issue. Um, well, so we're seeing a lot more people to formalise their complaints, complaints about it. Yeah. Um, can I also ask one more question? So we're talking medium density zoning. Some of these precincts um, are changing, as mentioned in conversation, quite rapidly. Mm. So um, Robert Street, there, you know, I've been in town over 20 years. It's yet high density, there's a lot of short-term accommodation, but the precinct has changed quite um, significantly and people are knocking down duplexes and building homes. Um, has any consideration been made um, in that regard when precincts are changing um, the fabric, uh, the, the people aren't using the land use for, for the designated use, they're using it to build these big mansions? Yeah, certainly as part of um, scheme process, processes that's uh, looked at yeah. in terms of you know what's what's happening out there in in the landscape in terms of what's changing what's the trends what does our scheme need to address um, but that that's a process that can continue it's quite typical for planning schemes to go through a series of amendments in its life uh, so that will continue mm -hmm. okay thanks Thank so you. I'll, i think i moved it i don't think i've got a seconder <laughs> seconded by <laughs> councillor Finzel. Do we need any more discussion? No. no. All those in favour? Carried unanimously. We're all ordering dinner for Monday. <laughs> 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 okay, so move on to item three, which is a mature change of use for other change development approval for mature uh, yeah, for multiple housing, type three retirement and special needs at 186 Croy Nusa Road and 4 Caramar Street to Wanton. I'll move for staff recommendation. Okay. Yeah. I think Councillor yeah. Finzel yeah. asked to yeah. go to the general committee as well. Yeah. Do you have any significance of that matter? Um, Were there any questions or further information required from Council? Well, it, it just seems reading through it that this is an evolution that that's happened. That it's you know they're they're working on the car parks. We said, oh geez, well hey, you know that's a good idea. Let's let's, let's run that. Is that an accurate description of what's happened here? Uh, there is a car parking um, rate which they need to provide across the site and that was born out of the uh, original approval for an additional 32 beds on the site and as part of their, their works to achieve that required amount of car parking they've identified that they would like to move 15 spaces to the adjoining what was previously residential zone land which is now its own community um, and that is to facilitate um, some of their sort of Work, working areas, uh, workshops, and having some manoeuvrability around the site. So that's yeah. the, so to maintain the, the same number of car parking that I, is required. I think the evolutions come a little bit from that Karama have been buying up those properties in in mm. Karama Street, and with the new planning scheme, there's been a change of zoning, mm -hmm. um, so that's allowed them more scope in their planning and and perhaps led to these changes. Mm. Mm. How many complaints have we had from residents? 
about this application? Mm -hmm. Um, what's the number, Patrick? Well, this is a code accessible application, um, so there was no submissions, there's no need for notification. Oh, okay. Um, we have received some complaints recently mm. associated with the development yeah. of um, the double storey component, mm. which is um, sort of in that uh, northeastern corner of the site. So, unrela yeah. unrelated to this application, unrelated oh, to the. Unrelated. Yeah, so the car parking. Um, that they possibly wouldn't even know uh, that, that that's a foot because again there's no notification yeah. but the complaints have not been related to car parking matters. It is something that we're seeing a little bit of as development assessment officers is um, you know there's been quite a push by the state government to lower the assessment levels from impact to code mm -hmm. um, but the consequence of that it means that unless people are understanding and reading new planning schemes um, you get development proposals next door being built and they can be unaware that that's yeah. a possibility. Mm -hmm. uh, so certainly with the complaints we've received about that two-storey house, it seems to be where that's coming from because yeah. it's just, it's been through a code assessment process, it wasn't publicly advertised, so um, there's sort of a, a reliance on people having to look at the planning scheme and understand yeah. what that means. Okay, thank you. Just a question in terms of um, providing the car park on one block of land for use on another block of land. Historically, we have things called conjoint use agreements and things like that. Do we have anything with in the current legislator or in the conditions that merge titles? Yeah, yeah, like you know, like it used to be a problem until the, and then they 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 tried to solve it by that particular issue by saying you could apply as a conjoint use agreement, but did. Or you had a requirement that the uh, titles need to be merged. Merged, yeah, not yeah. merged. Yeah. Uh, typically, well, I think what you're more referring to happens when a property Across is quite road. separated yeah. by yeah, other properties, rather Across than a, yeah. rather than a, you know yeah. this one's adjoining. So it's a natural extension, and the application is over both sites, not just the new uh, car park area. Yeah. So they're just essentially extending onto an adjoining block, yeah. um, and they've come back through it as a another ch another change, which you're allowed to do under the planning yeah. act. Yeah. Yeah, it's still a condition, it just means if they did happen to sell that off, they would no longer comply. comply with their planning approval. Yeah, and be kicking old people out of the house. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, we haven't recommended it to council, but if council was concerned about that, you could include a condition for amalgamation of the lots. Mm -hmm. Probably got the same application in, in practice that they can't use it without it. Yeah. So, but the risk is pretty low, but if your council wants to do that, Perhaps they could. Yeah, if, it's going back Monday if yeah. you have a bit of a think about what yeah. might be the right way to go. Mm -hmm. right, think about it, right, finish it, just in case. Yep. Okay, so that's been, would you like to move that to be referred to? Yeah. So moved by Councillor Pinzel and seconded by Councillor Wegner. Yeah. We don't wish to discuss anymore. Yeah, All in favour? Okay. Carried unanimously. Thanks Patrick. Thanks Patrick. Item four. I don't think anyone's up to this to be referred. No, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, a straightforward matter of defending an appeal. Do we have any questions or comments? No? Would anyone like to move the recommendation? Move Councillor Wegner. I'll second it. Oh. Any discussion? No? You want to rebut any of the ma the, the debate? <laughs> <Can't talk again>? no. <laughs> there wasn't any. Um, I'll move the motion. All in favour? Carried unanimously. Um, number five is Planning Environment Court Appeal oh, B897. Now, we do have a range of um, conflicts to declare, but if we declare the interest first without uh, leaving the room because there may be a procedural matter that we can do. Um, yeah, maybe I'll just it. explain that. One of the, the, the good things out of the October um, amendments to the Local Government Act last year is if there's a majority of councillors who have a conflict of interest, you can still deal with a matter of what I call from a procedural perspective. In other words, you can actually collectively pass a resolution to refer the matter to the General Committee if you wish to, um, which would be the appropriate thing to do. So. My advice would be just to go through and make your declarations. You still need to do that. We'll do those in order. 
and then we make that procedural resolution from there. So, yeah. And then there was one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, so Councillor Wagner would probably be first. Uh, I, Councillor Wagner, informed the meeting that I have a prescribed conflict of interest in this matter as I have an NBN tower located on my property and receive income from NBN via a lease arrangement. As a result of my conflict of interest, I will now leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted on. I think we could probably change that to as I propose to leave the meeting room. Mm. Um, yeah. Yeah, that matter, it's a standard matter of being voted. Yep. Okay. Are you happy to change that? Uh, yeah, I propose to leave the room. Councillor Finzel? I, Councillor Finzel, inform the meeting that I have a declarable <coughs> conflict of interest in this matter. As prior to my election to council, I signed a petition relating to this application. As a result of my conflict of interest, I propose to leave the meeting room while the matter is considered and voted on. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, yes, I wish to inform the meeting that I too have a declarable conflict of interest in this matter. As Bill and Christine Tastes, who are correspondents to this appeal, uh, works. <laughs> <laughs> Take your time. Take your time. Yeah, oh, dear. Stick on the throat. Supported my 2020 election campaign by undertaking letterbox drops. Um, as a result of this conflict of interest, I propose to leave the meeting room while the application is considered and voted on. So, councillors, under the under the act now, you do have the ability to deal with a procedural motion um, and stay in the room and deal with that. Obviously, you can't deal with what I call a substantive motion, which is about the appeal itself. But you could pass a um, resolution referring this matter to the uh, general committee on the basis that you don't have a quorum to deal with this matter at this committee. Would you like to move that, councillor? Sure, I'll move it. <laughs> the only clean skin. The councillors can. Council Finzel seconded it. Yep. All in favour. I'll just um, update councillors. Uh, all co-respondents have now either withdrawn from the appeal or have indicated they will withdraw if council agrees uh, with the recommendation. Thank you. Thanks, Kerry. So we move on to item six, which is the draft yes, Bushland Reserve Strategic That's Management good. Plan. I think this one too has been requested to be referred to the general committee, but I'm sure we may have some questions before. Yeah. Yeah. Michael, how are you? So we have Michael and Peter addressing the table, and curly ones go straight to crash. <laughs> <laughs> my, my questions pertain particularly around the fire management um, plan 2021. So just in regard to that, are we, we are working closely with QPWS and QFES in regard to that. Yes, definitely, and uh, even to the point where we're looking at developing multi-agency fire plans, uh, yeah. particular particular hotspot areas that are difficult to manage. Yeah. We can't just manage on our bushland reserve. We have to take a, a broader view with private landholders and QP as a national park. So, yes. Okay. So, Peter, when we talk about fire trail widening, fuel reduction zones, and planned burns, this is all being done. In, in consultation and collaboration with QFES and QPWS. Yes, and we're still, th this is also the purpose of putting this draft out there is to do further consultation. So we've had some basic um, meetings and consultations and we do that through the fire management group as well. Yeah. But this is the next step in actually um, formalising those yeah. arrangements, I guess, yeah. Okay. yeah. So when we say um, it's, we're taking more of a um, risk management approach, um, I think taking, um, it says that, uh, on page 78, the draft Bushland Reserve Strategic Fire Management Plan 2021 replaces the 2015 plan and has been updated to take a greater risk management approach, recognising there are multiple factors um, involved. Put, um, is that what you've just talked about in regard to those various aspects? Uh, more so in the nature of the methodology that we applied. So the, the 2015 plan was very much based on vegetation type as to how we assessed our risk. But we wanted to take it a bit broader than, than that and say, well, it's, it's not just risk based on, based on vegetation, it's actually risk 
in terms of uh, where neighbours mm -hmm. live and their buildings and structures. Okay. It's also based on who's actually on the reserve at the time, which was something the 2015 plan didn't consider. Yeah. So it's, it's a broader, I guess, more holistic look at, at all the risks, not just one or two defined risks. So it was a different methodology. Yeah, yeah. Things have advanced too since yeah. 2015 in terms of the state mm -hmm. legislation and policy. So we wanted to build that into the, into the new plan as well. In the new plan, and this might be a separate issue, but are we talking to agencies like Fireball International and those sort of things about fire mitigation sort of um, structures and infrastructure and things like that, or is that is that separate to to exactly this sort of push the reserve fire management? I'm not familiar with Fireball, but I'm happy to take that on board yeah. and we can yeah. Yeah. consult yeah. with them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We can include that in the in the consultation. Yeah, yeah. So maybe a better way to answer that question with um, Peter, that the area of councils, um, or the area of the total land of the Shire that's covered by this plan, what would it's it only four percent, less than four percent. Yeah. So that's yeah. 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 the eyeball approach would be more broad yeah, in the national park. Yeah, okay. Like that. So it's only a very small portion of what's covered. I think yeah. we've got to be careful too not to mix up uh, fire response and fire management. Yep. Mm, so yep. there's there's the emergency services side of things, but mm. this this is very much focused on management. Yep. So this is about plan burns, you know, fire fuel trials, reduction. fuel mm. reduction, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. So we don't actually in, in this plan this plan we don't address actual yep. fire okay. response. But it's good to read that you're taking a greater risk management approach. I think that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. So when I look at the risk map. I can see uh, Giroin down to the top of the lake, and that makes sense. I can see the area which includes the, book, the back of Boring Point Caravan Park, and that'll be because of a range of vegetation characters. The one over to the west that's red, I'm trying to pick that. Is that, that would be Simplocus, I would imagine that would be Pomona. So Pomona has a lot, quite a lot of um, eucalypt forest, tall open that forest. Is, yeah, and it's around Stratford Park would be the adjacent Stratford neighbours. Stratford yeah. Park. Is back on and, the, and the risk there is vegetation um, basically going from bushland reserve, state forest, into, um, right into residential areas. Right. So there's these corridors of vegetation running across all different land tenures. And that's one of the focus areas for our multi-agency plans, yeah. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Councillor Amelia. Um, sorry, one quick question. Um, we're opening this strategic management plan for public consultation. Um, you identify, I think, on page 80 that one of the criticisms um, will be that some residents aren't going to agree with the privatisation um, of areas, of risk areas. Yep. Um, so knowing that you're going to get that feedback, um, how will you how will you use that feedback in a strategic management plan? If someone says, um, you know, um, disagree, my area's at higher risk than what council have identified, um, will there be a process or an opportunity for them to um, meet with council staff or at least argue that um, it's revisited? Sure. Um, we've actually got a process for that identified in the in the FNP, and I'll just see if I can find the table there. But it's a good point, and it's often it's something that often comes up um, because we have our priorities. So obviously, we can't do everything at once, so we have this methodology to determine our priorities. People, <coughs> my residents, may have particular ownership of their own park next door, so they may not necessarily agree. Uh, so we've got a um, so I'll find on page is it twenty two in your document? This this one the attachment. Yeah, yes. The attachment. Yes. Yeah. yeah. So basically, it's just if we have customer requests come in and it's identified as a height a very high fire danger area then um, if it's already identified, it'll already be part of the on-ground operational plan. And it'll either be to look at it on ground or to make, make sure we're satisfied that we've actually put the risk mitigation measures in place. If it's not part of that, there's a process of review. So we can, as I say, meet, meet with the resident, go out on site, review the situation. We see how it fits with the other reserves and it might be you know, a valid um, request 
or it might be, well, you know, some people have got different interpretations of what, what actually fire risk is. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, well, maybe on, on from that last question, you have the expert panel, um, which is mentioned on 50. Who, who's on the expert panel? Okay. Uh, Are you talking about the strategic plan or the strategic plan? Bushland Reserve strategic plan. This one, yes. Um, essentially, it was uh, I'm into own stuff. Um, I'm across multiple departments and or teams and or units. So, um, unfortunately, there was no, there was essentially no one external for that panel. That's just kind of coming on from Amelia's question. She maybe their community might be. That maybe maybe that's the, another avenue for a community to be involved. Yes. If we've got expertise in the community, yes. and I, I happen to know we do have expertise in in boring points. Totally. Just, <laughs> just, just on that same document that Tom's talking about um, mm -hmm. on page twenty, it talks about the um, fire at five point two, and it says the state planning policy bush fire prone mapping identifies priority areas at a statewide level. And the CSIRO have developed a methodology based on vegetation type, fuel load, all that kind of thing. Are we following these guidelines or are they driving our strategic plan? Yes. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Correct. Terrific. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, Michael, Peter, thank you. Uh, there's a good body of work here and it's been, um, from what I can see, very thorough. So thank you for the report. Um, under risks and opportunities on page 80, um, one of the risks you've mentioned is that resources such as qualified contractors and or internal staff are not available for delivery. Um, are you exploring the options of, especially looking at you know, COVID and training and employment opportunities, um, are you looking at that to counteract the risk you've mentioned? Is there any, how are we heading along around that? Why is everyone looking at Brett? Come on, Craig. Come, <laughs> come join the table. That's a really good question. <laughs> it's one I've asked. Yeah, well. we need enough money on the ground to actually then fulfil the requirements. Uh, look, uh, uh, we do. Um, I, I think we've developed a really strong strategic plan here with a really clear guideline on where we need to do with our fire management. Um, we've had certainly over the last 12 months some logistical challenges on being able to deliver on our strategic intent, particularly around prescribed burning. Uh, one of those challenges are is there's simply not a lot of available contractors and consultants out there to undertake that work. Mm -hmm. And where there is, they're not necessarily local or they're located, they're also being contracted by other councils. So it's very difficult to get them on the ground when we need to. Um, we are absolutely looking for solutions. We've had a meeting with the executive just before Christmas. We've got another one due quite soon. And we're also doing this part of this budget process to look at what options are available to us that enable us to deliver those controlled burns. Mm -hmm. uh, but there's a range of elements that go into that around uh, the corporate risk um, to council of any actions we take and also not undertaking actions. Mm -hmm. um, so while this strategic plan says what we need to do, we've been somewhat less clear on exactly how we're going to do it as we as we work through a way uh, to have better success than we did in the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. Because certainly what we found last year is there was no shortage of resources or well, well resourced to undertake the control burns we wanted to undertake. But for uh, reasons of availability of contractors, we simply weren't able to get all the ones done. So in those circumstances, we had to try and use other methods which can revolt, result in vegetation loss and damage by building Wi-Fi, water fire breaks, which is not what the community wants to see and not what we want to see. Craig answered that very well. Yeah. Um, I guess just adding Thanks, to it, Craig. you know, just adding to it is, is essentially with the fires last year, every council across Queensland looking at what they can do with more controlled burns and what they need to do. So the, the number of contractors available to do that is a very specialised field and, mm. and they're getting stretched. So we just can't get people when we want to because you have the windows are narrowing when we can do it and yeah. it's narrowing for everyone and everyone's after the same group of contractors to do that work. So we know that our current model can't be sustainable for everyone. So now we're in debate, okay, if that's not working, what's the alternative? Mm -hmm. You know, one of the alternatives is just council do those burns itself. And that keeps me awake at night thinking about a, a, a council <laughs> burn getting out of control. Yeah. 
what's you know what's happening now is not working and it's not going to be suitable for the future. So we've got to look at alternatives. <coughs> That's what we're looking at. What that might what that might be. It might be a combination. It might be a combination. Just with regard to the external consultation, Nurse from District Landcare, Safe Assure and QFES, have we talked to the Cabby Cabby people at all or will they have an input in regard to this? Yeah, so we've made contact with the Kabi Kabi and um, they're, they're keen to um, be involved um, further down the track when yeah. things are a bit more formalised and uh, rather than just meeting over one particular issue as in the mm -hmm. fire, they want to meet regarding a range range of issues and it's I guess it's, it's a better you know, economy of time for the Kabi Kabi because okay. they are busy. Yeah. Okay, so it has been re requested to be referred. Would someone like to move that? Oh, oh you've got more questions? <laughs> um, I'll boil it down to one basic philosophical question. You know, we have our, our the area that we're in control of, which is 4% of the, the total, and then of course you get your state, your commonwealth, this, private, land, all the different ways. How do you organize it in your minds? Like, you know, where are responsibilities beginning and end with all this land? Because the, the uses, the, the importance, the biodiversity, which is, you know, the number one goal is to maintain the biodiversity but it's chopped up in a, in a haphazard fashion when you look at it from you know god probably would not have organized it the way he did the way it organized, organized it. how do you how do you make sense of it we, we use uh, that that's through our methodology that we use so we, we use the csiro methodology but also uh, I, I guess you call it a multi-criteria analysis so you look at the biodiversity values you look at the risk to people on park or reserve, you look at the risk to people off park. So it's a range of, of values that you look at, and then we just weighted those values. The spreadsheet, which isn't included to this report, is weighted and has lots of different criteria. And then we apply weightings to what we think is the most you know, important area, particularly the neighbor, the neighbor that interface between with the neighbors and, and the bushland reserve. And you come up with weightings at the end, and then it's just a juggling thing on your on your spreadsheet to bring up what the priorities are. So that's how that's how we do it. Because yeah. maintaining biodiversity is so important. If uh, in here it's what no forty percent percent of the weight yeah. is on maintaining biodiversity, but then in order to maintain that biodiversity some places need to be burnt every so often. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to go in and burn an area where the exact opposite might be a couple of blocks over where there's a rainforest mm -hmm. and you don't want to burn that. So that's Craig, Craig, you can also yep. add to the I call it coordination group about the fires with national parks and all that sort of stuff. Just explain how that works, how the group gets together and coordinates when we're going to do burns. And it does. Uh, there's a rain, um, the, the area fire management group brings together all key landholders throughout Noosa twice a year, uh, pre season and post season, to discuss all the proposed burns at different agencies, <coughs> uh, council, QPWS, um, QFES, and rules are on that, um, also DNRM and um, who else is on that, Michael? Unity Water. Unity Water, SEQ Water. Um, so basically that's where we develop our program. Um, we also meet separately with um, Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service in more detail, um, where we go through all our proposed burns and how we can work together uh, on burns we're undertaking during that year. Because the area fire management group is quite broad. They focus on the four or five key areas for the season. Whereas when we meet with Q Queensland Parks and Wildlife Service, we focus on every burn. Uh, and every action. And in an area like Giraween is a really good example um, where we've actually both agencies have got control burns planned over the next couple of years. We've got other fire mitigation activities going on there. Um, so we basically talk through exactly what we're doing, what can work together and what can't work together. Thank you. Can I ask a question, Brian? You may. Um, has La Nina and um, the forecast of frequent rain events, has that influenced or informed this sky management plan? Or do you guys just go down your own path um, and don't take too much notice of um, forecasted rain events? And in, in all sincerity, um, you know, hmm. I'm not, not being funny. <clears throat> well, in terms of climate change, a lot of that's factored into the state mapping products anyway. So we, we, we use those products um, to plan out our long-term strategic plan at a local level. Um, but in terms, so that the mapping that that's provided in here is a strategic map. It's not necessarily influenced by, by daily conditions or even you know seasonal conditions. 
And that's the same as the state mapping. It's based on vegetation type. So that vegetation, you know, could be a high potential um, intensity fire, um, regardless of the conditions on the day. Okay. But then we take it to the next step when it, when it gets to an operational level, is actually from local knowledge and also by looking at, at the site, um, we then determine the actual risk. So it's a two-step pro process. So it's a strategic overview for the strategic plan and then there's, there's an operational assessment. And to give an example, if you were to go up to, say, Kuroiba Nature Re Refuge today, you would not get a fire in it at all. But it is actually mapped as, as very high fire risk. And that's because it burnt back in 2019, it burnt, and we've had lots of rain recently, so it's not going to be a high risk. But strategically, it's still flagged as an important um, high, high rated park as a priority. Um, and so the, the conditions can change. We can get a bushfire, you know, somewhere on a, on a park. Immediately you've got no uh, hazard after the bushfire, so it's, it's not rated as a high risk locally. Yeah. So just one question. I know that you've got a list of proposed target consultations. Um, do we have any bush care groups that are active in the management of any of our bushland reserves and would they would be appropriate to add them to the list? We have consulted them. Um, Already? Yes, so, um, in the first draft of this of the bushland Re reserve strategic plan. Um, it was presented to them about, um, about uh, towards the end, towards the end of last year. Um, yes. Oh good. Yep, there's one on the list. Yes. <laughs> okay. Cheers. Councillor Jerusalem was keen to go to the General Committee, it's an area of... Oh, Councillor Jerusalem, let's vote it now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I'll move that the matter be referred to the General Committee meeting. I'll second that, Councillor. Moving to the issue, all in favour? Done. Yes, so move you. on to yeah, item 7, okay. which okay. is the <laughs> variations uh, to the development of separate fees and charges for July to yeah. December of last year. Thank you. So do we have any questions? Um, I'd, I'd like to make a comment concerning the no worries are the holiday park up in Curley. Yep. And um, just I, I followed that because I was going to get a newly elected council that went up there and um, the a quick overview of, of the property. The guy is, is an immigrant. Maybe has a, a bit of trouble with the English, but he is a great gardener, and my gosh, is it an incredible holiday park. It is absolutely beautiful. Um, and I'm very happy that, that you reduced the rates uh, of, of charging him. Um, I know that, that the, the background story that staff may have not had is he has kids during the fires, and the kids, um, the, the husband is a firefighter, so he's off, and they had a house down there that was you know in line, so they immediately dropped everything, drove down, um, helped out that the kids with the fire came back and found that their their um, license had lapsed and they were being they had to reapply again at an enormous expense and a seven thousand dollar application fee for and they they were of the opinion or, or told me that they only there was just one letter sent to them and then when they didn't reapply they they let they had to, when they didn't pay the fee they were stuck with this enormous task of reapplying for what they're already doing. Is, is that accurate, Kerry? Um, I understand there was a conversation with the owner at the counter before it lapsed, and so he was certainly aware of it. Um, I, I don't understand why he missed the time frame. So, yeah, I'd have to, that's, that's all I know about that one. Okay. Well, anyway, I'm just so happy that, that you gave him, you know, that, that we... Yeah. Yeah. No further questions? I'm um, sure okay. Councillor Wigner would like to move it or? <laughs> One more question. One more question or statement from the floor? Statement. <laughs> no, I, I'm that's sorry. Point, I, that's your job. I, I, now that I've, I've learned that um, we're, that that staff is much more accessible, that I actually should be going through all these concerns and meeting with staff um, rather than dragging us. But I thought that this, this meeting was 
for us to, to meet with Jeff and, and, and ask you know very long questions and take a lot of everybody's time. Um, Staff would welcome, welcome, staff would welcome you, and the councillors would also welcome you. I see some of the staff. Yeah. I always enjoy your questions. <laughs> <laughs> and and you're long with it. So well, hopefully this will be one of the last times. But could you I I explain what again on uh, page um, eighty-five? The resort complex. Why? Why we reduced? Why we knocked a hundred thousand dollars? Yeah. Off of this because this you know the, it seems to be the exact opposite of the No Worries Caravan Park, where this person probably isn't such a sympathetic customer. <laughs> okay, so I can't base application fees on the person or their their responsibilities or to the community. It has to be based on what we consider the likely assessment costs only. So our fees are meant to be basically equivalent to what it costs council in assessing the application. So as, as the report presents, components of this proposal, the resort, are compliant with the planning scheme, but there are some elements that are non-compliant. Um, uh, so that, that's, that's what really why the fees were varied. Um, so currently there's a multiplier that applies to our fees and charges of three, where the use is identified as inconsistent in the planning scheme. And because this proposal goes partly outside the visitor accommodation zone, it is inconsistent, um, but a portion of it is well within that zone as well. Um, so yeah, it, it's really based on, I guess, um, my yeah. experience and the level, of assessment. the level of assessment and the extent of work yeah. likely to be required in assessing the application. And the level of inconsistency, as the way I read it, related mm. to the odour buffer, the rates the buffer. That, that may impact on the pool or recreation yeah. area. Yeah, and I think it has to be recognised there wasn't necessarily the detailed odour report in drawing that line on the new scheme in terms of where that odour line should be. So that will come as part of the application. So it's potential that it will vary. Okay. All good? Mm -hmm. I'll move it. Move Councillor Stewart. Second of Councillor Finzel. Any discussion? All in favour? That was carried unanimously. We move on to item eight. And this is planning applications decided by delegated authority. Uh, it will be noted that Councillor Lawrence has exited the building. So do we have any questions? I do, Kerry, and this is just out of interest. Um, most of these are approved, but the ones that have been refused, mm -hmm. uh, do they then have a right to go back and work with their town planner or work with council to try and get approval? I mean, it's not like a complete refusal. If, if I mean, are they given reasons why they have a refusal and they can come back and work? To, yeah, 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 certainly. And, and officers in assessing an application will raise issues in the information request mm -hmm. formally of what they need to address, we'll try and discuss those concerns with the, the applicant and their consultant. We'll again then raise it in the decision time frame um, before we actually make a decision for refusal. So there's always the opportunity to come back and relodge an application if they do get a refusal mm -hmm. and review that. Um, there are two applications there that have been refused by delegation that were superseded planning scheme requests. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, so there is no real opportunity to relodge those. The process would be, um, you know, if they're seeking compensation, if they think that that's relevant, they would have to launch an application under the new planning scheme and have that refused or conditioned and then, then need to apply to the court for a claim of compensation. Okay, thank you. <coughs> now, further questions? I'm happy to move it. And Councillor Wagner, he can be the seconder. All in favour? Passed. And that brings us to the end of the meeting, I understand. Thank you, Mr Chair. Finished Thank you, Chair. 11.07. 11.07. Thanks, Gary. That was good.